This is a re-uploaded copy of my previous video, which has been blocked in the USA and dependent territories. The reason given is that between minute 415 and minute 429, I'm violating a copyright because of a song playing in the background of a Brexit party rally. It is entirely possible that the blocking was generated automatically. However, the background clip was 14 seconds long and almost unrecognisable, seeing that it was being played over a PA system in a large hall with plenty of echo. And given that the rally in Birmingham was much better attended than most other political rallies in this country anyway, and that it got very little exposure on mainstream media over here in Britain. Well, given all of that, and given how this clip shows how well attended the rally was and how much enthusiasm it was generating, I have to admit to a certain scepticism about the motives for the blocking of this video, in which I spoke well of Trump and even better of Nigel Farage. I therefore would appreciate it if you'd share this particular video as much as you can. 15 seconds of the sound might be missing, but the picture is still there and the sentiments need some exposure. Thank you and on with the show. Hello. Well, Boris Johnson got the job, didn't he? It's sort of interesting because he's been widely characterised by the intellectual media uh, as a buffoon with hair. And that's exactly how they saw Donald Trump as well when he got the job. And it struck me there's a great deal of similarity between the two men, uh, not in their educational or even their familial background, of course. Hang on a minute. Yeah, it's there. But in their general attitude to life, that is, Boris Johnson wasn't a businessman before he was a politician, but he certainly had a very varied life experience outside politics, which involved a lot of writing and interaction with, well, for instance, journalists, other journalists who disagreed with his politics as well as the ones who agreed with him. In other words, he hasn't lived his life in a political hothouse, just like Trump didn't live his life in a political hothouse. Trump was a businessman. I think the big difference, and the big difference that everyone saw between Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson, was that Hunt was seen as a career politician, whereas Johnson was, and still is seen as a bit of an amateur. And although we hope he's going to make a good politician and the sort of negotiator that we need in our current situation, we also feel that his reactions are going to be more, well, natural, more the way we feel about things than the way a trained professional might have been moulded into feeling. It's true I think we all had an idea about how Hunt would perform. We all sort of felt we could predict. And I think we're all a bit unsure about how Johnson will perform. But people seem to have more trust with his style simply because they don't see him as a career man uh, whom they can predict in the same way. And I think Actually, no, I'm positive. This is how American voters saw Trump as well. Voters trusted him to act like them. Uh, there's the other thing as well, the ability to get things moving, to make contacts, to use contacts. I went to the Brexit rally in Birmingham um, about three weeks ago, I suppose. It was held in the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham, a huge place. And we were in an auditorium. Uh, we were told it held 5,000 people. I'd say there were nearly 4,000 people there. And that was a short notice occasion. It wasn't like it had been planned months ahead. 
In fact, the Brexit party had been a going concern for about five weeks, I think. And yet they would still managed to sweep the European elections and they would managed also to organise this huge gathering. It, it was... It wasn't only that there were so many enthusiastic people willing to drop everything and get on the train to Birmingham with so little planning, and the British don't take their politics anywhere near as seriously as they do in America. I want to tell you, uh, you Americans. Uh, But the event itself was as slick as any American political rally. Um, I took some footage... I might put a a couple of clips. I'll, I'll put it. It's that side, isn't it? I'll put a couple of clips up there. Uh, maybe you can uh, see what's going on. This is where the copyright strike took my video down in the USA and its dependent territories. So you'll just have to imagine a lot of inspirational music playing here. In the background. That's it. But it was a landslide. We secured 50% more votes than any other single party. We We got more votes than the Labour Party and the Conservative Party put together. Imagine that. than the Labour Party and the Conservative Party put together. Imagine that. It was obvious that Farage had taken some cues from his experience on the Trump campaign trail. No doubt about that. I was struck by the professionalism of the operation. Every chair had a Brexit T-shirt over the back and a handful of glow sticks to wave on cue and a stack of Brexit Party newspapers, which you could take away with you. And at the end, they were giving away Brexit Party shopping bags filled with Brexit Party newspapers for you to take home and distribute in your neighbourhood. Yeah, it was very professional. And they had a set of speakers um, who were from the world of business, acting as warm-ups to the main event, which was Farage himself, and preceded, I might say, by a parade of constituency candidates who'd be running in the next general elections. It was incredibly well organised. I think there were about a 100 of these candidates and there was a promise that there'd be a candidate picked for every constituency in the United Kingdom. And although there were things that I disagreed with that Farage said, I couldn't help but contrast this great and impressive piece of well-organised political theatre with the shambolic mess of the so-called independent group, which was a group of career politicians who should have had an advantage because they were already, already elected MPs in the Houses of Parliament who left their political parties Uh, For principle, uh, in the case of Labour defectors, they disagreed with the racist direction of their party. And in the case of the Conservatives, because they wanted to stay in the European Union, I disagree with that, but all perfectly worthy ideals. But they couldn't get their act together. They couldn't organise a proper party. They couldn't get the proper connections to get the printing done and the... And the rallies and all, they, they just couldn't do it. They, without the party machine behind them, they were completely at sea. When they ran in the European elections, they didn't even have a logo. The Brexit party had a logo almost as soon as Farage had thrown his hat into the ring. And as they said, a whole load of other supporters and financial backers as well. And that's the difference. People have the feeling that many politicians have never had a proper job and they don't really know much about anything in the real world. And actually, that's been going on for a while in Britain, this professionalism of politics and this lack of knowledge of how things really operate. And I don't think the British public like it very much. 
it used to be that Parliament had very weird hours for sitting. They sat until very late at night, specifically because they started late, because it was set up for people who went to their offices in the morning and ran businesses and were captains of industry uh, or who had to get the train in from their homes and businesses outside London. These were people who knew about the real world and who went into politics as a form of public service. That was the theory. Uh, oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, in the book, Remains of the Day, um, uh, Ka oh, Kazuo Ishiguro, one of his characters, let's see, what was his name? He was an American senator called Lewis. Lewis, he tells his British hosts that they're political amateurs, doesn't he? Uh, that they were working on feelings and ideals rather than political realities and that their sort of person was going out of fashion. Uh, Ishiguro was making a very valid point because there has been a huge change in the sort of politics uh, that have been going on recently. Now, well... Most people in politics now, they go straight from school to university. They do PPE, that's um, politics, philosophy and economics. And then they go into some sort of political work, you know, being an assistant to an MP or, or, or that sort of thing. And there they get well schooled in keeping their emotions and their opinions to themselves and as bland and as pointless as possible so they don't actually offend anyone. Well, except for Labour, who make an exception for offending Jews, of course. But then, <laughs> who doesn't? Uh, anyway, back to the main uh, subject. I think most people realise that there's something about a politician who's been earning a salary out in the real world, in the world of work, that gives them a, a better grasp. Well, I, 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 what do you mean, a feeling? I believe that too. Johnson's opponents make much of his privileged position as an old Etonian, but he's worked outside the Westminster bubble, and, and that's what's important. And I don't think people care where he went to school. What they care of is that as a journalist, he's had to write down his opinions, he's had to put forward controversial opinions and then have them challenged not only by political opponents, because after all, you can always discount the opinions or the criticisms of your opponents, but he's been criticised by his colleagues as well, and that's much more difficult to come to terms with, isn't it? Johnson's been forced to set his opinions down, to think them through, and, and then to have them shot down in flames. And he's had to either rethink or elaborate or or even, God save us, to, to change his mind. And that's something a career politician gets very little opportunity to do, you know. I'm not saying he's going to be the best prime minister ever. He's very much an unknown quantity. But his acceptance speech seems to me to be a good omen. There was no triumphalism. There was no fist punching in the air. He was generous to uh, Jeremy Hunt, his opponent. He was generous to the outgoing Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May. I, I did find that rather nice. Look, he's the sort of person who takes pratfalls. But then so do we all. We all make mistakes, but we make mistakes when we take steps out of our com comfort zones, don't we? He does look like a fool sometimes, but then that's the problem with a lot of politicians. They don't want to look like fools, so they won't take those steps that might end up in embarrassment. If you've never looked like a fool, it's because you've never tried anything. If you've never made a mistake, it's because you've never stepped out of your comfort zone. It isn't the mistakes it's what you make of them that moves our societies forward. So, well, I think Farage must be hitting his head against the wall right now because the only person who could possibly put a stop to the rise of the Brexit party is Johnson. Provided he delivers, of course. Well, we'll see. But we can always hope, can't we?
click on like it really does help with the algorithm then click on subscribe and then on the bell sometimes you may find your subscription has lapsed without your knowledge so keep on checking that button thanks for listening please like and subscribe and if you wish to donate click the subscribe star link where you can make a one-off payment or set up a regular contribution or I have a PayPal account at grannyopteryx at gmail.com. Till next time.